thanks everybody for coming out. Great to see some new faces. We've seen some new faces over the past couple weeks and that's always fantastic to add some new perspective. So for those of you um, who haven't come before, just to give you an outline of how today's presentation will go, we'll go around the room and do introductions. Just say who you are, who you're with, gives you a chance to know who your neighbor is in the audience um, and everyone else a chance to know maybe what you do and what your background is. Um, we, this whole One Million Cups um, event is made possible thanks to our sponsors. So we've got Field 59 and Derek in the back there. Uh, they do the video recording and live streaming of every event. So if you ever can't make it, um, you can click a link on our website or in our newsletter and you can tune in to today's presentation. And then if you're looking for past presentations, they're all available on our YouTube channel. We also have the coffee over here, uh, courtesy of Old National Bank and Crescendo. So help yourself, casual group here, feel free to get up during the presentation and grab some coffee. And then of course we've got the library space, um, thanks to Tom and the Madison Public Library. Do you have anything? Yeah, uh, just a reminder, June 6th and 7th uh, at Union South is the Wisconsin Entrepreneurs Conference put on by the Wisconsin Technology Council. Uh, that's one of two major events that the Tech Council puts on every year. Uh, two days, uh, Rachel is moderating a panel. Um, and you were? And I'm sitting on a panel. Um, I mean, not that you would come just for us, but yes, Steve. Speaking of the Tech Council, they just had an event yesterday that several of us here were about the gig economy. Was it was the Win Luncheon? Or? Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, Okay. right. Yeah, and just FYI, it was, it was relevant to this group because it was about gig economy, you know, startups and how that works. So FYI, it was a neat um, discussion. That's a, that's a good yeah. point to announce that every it's every month on uh, second Tuesday of the month. First. Yeah. Monthly, there are these Win Wisconsin Innovation Network luncheons. Um, they are, I think, a cost-effective alternative to actually joining the Tech Council. I think they're. You can register I think it's like 25, 30 yeah, bucks, yeah, 30 and you get usually you get a lunch with it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's you the always networking. Steal the Rachel. A very good lunch. Yeah. <laughs> you always get a very good lunch. You're in here first. Everyone's got a hot meal. Yeah. <laughs> and there are so you're meals, hot meal. by the way, as well. So there's a really good grilled cheese. Bucks. Yeah. Okay. It's <laughs> was there like a vegan option or? Uh, there was a really good salad. <laughs> the <Okay>. salad. <laughs> so you could eat the salad portion. Um, of what about gluten free? Are they, are they gluten sensitive? No. All right. Anyway. So Wisconsin Technology Council has a lot of events with Win and the Tech Council proper. Uh, Sixth and seventh Entrepreneurs Conference Union South. Uh, well worth your time if you are at any stage in the development of your business or just curious about Madison. Also, we are still in the process of sourcing candidates for the three roles, executive director, director of operations, and did you already? No, I told Chandra to say it. <laughs> oh. You never gonna lose. Keep going, Drew. You're doing Just great. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And another position that I'll let Chandra describe <laughs> oh, about God. a thing in Madison that Chandra knows about. So a little preview. By the way, I'm Drew Corson from Carrick's Consulting Group, and you are? I'm Alyssa, and I'm presenting today, right. so I'll save the rest. Uh, I'm Diana Pastrana. I uh, work in office interiors, uh, office furniture uh, for mostly growing and startup businesses, nonprofits. My name is Jason Nockrenner. I am with Integral Building Systems, and you can know me as the Blue Wire Guy. Uh, network infrastructure and then some of the little systems that hang off the networks are our forte. Good morning. Hi, I'm Carla. I just started <coughs> my own professional coaching company called Carla Marie Coaching, and I'm here to just all this out. I'm Carol and I'm between jobs and um, I'm mostly in marketing and communications my most recent um, employers were the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and a Grace Hospice Care and from time to time I think about starting a company on uh, WordPress word sites trying or WordPress websites trying to build those sites. I'm D.P. Knuton of Collaborator Creative. I creatively collaborate with people on everything from uh, freelance copywriting all the way through nonfiction branding and uh, messaging platforms for complicated companies. I'm Mitch DeWitt. I'm with Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, and I basically help my clients incorporate social and environmental criteria into their portfolio. I'm Chandra miller Feenan. I'm with Starting Block Madison, and to follow up with what Drew led off with, Starting Block is currently hiring. We're looking for three positions. Um, we have an open permanent executive director position, a director of operations and programming position, and then a new position, which I think is really exciting, which is a startup team strategist. 
and that position is to help um, young and growing startup companies develop their HR policies, their strategies, help recruit and retain um, their employees uh, that's designed just to work with startup companies. So if you have somebody that would be interested in those three positions, Carrick's Consulting is handling it for us. Um, so talk to, have them send the resumes to Rachel or Drew, not to me. Um, and we hope to have at least the startup team strategists online by the summer. Um, and then also, if you have entrepreneurs that are interested in going to the um, entrepreneur conference but might not be able to handle the um, uh, conference fee, let me know. I do have um, some people in our networks that have some subsidized rates for those. So. Uh, my name is Tom Willis. I'm a, uh, a leader in software engineering, and I do some uh, patent and IP consulting for uh, software and other technology startups as well. Uh, Bob Pope, the uh, research analyst for Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. I'm Alex Small. I'm a reporter for WISBusiness.com, and you can check out uh, coverage of that gig economy event at our website. I'm Dan Anderson. I work for uh, Baker Tilly. We're an accounting firm, and I work with uh, startups in the technology space. Good morning. I'm Steve Slatton, and I, too, am in between jobs. I'm a scientist and a business development guy. I worked in the engineering space for many years, and I'm um, here to, to network. I'm Joey Neeson. And I'm uh, Rick uh, Patam. Yeah, we are uh, we're students here and we are we have an idea for a sustainability startup uh, based on reducing consumer waste. So we're here to see kind of other people's ideas, how they get going, that kind of thing. What are uh, you what are you thinking of? Can you tell us? <laughs> um, yeah, well we want to start making a network of reusable products to replace disposal stuff, coffee cups, to-go boxes, pizza boxes. Eliminate consumer waste as yeah. much as we possibly can. Um, and we're trying to use this technology, RFID chips, um, for inventory tracking to kind of create a recirculating cycle of products so people don't have to throw things out, basically. Thanks. I'm Derek Gubler with Field 59 Video. I'm the uh, co-founder and, uh, and uh, owner and uh, CEO. And we, <laughs> all those things put together. And um, we're an online video solution for media companies. Um, Laurel Gosheroy, customer success at Akita Box. And then just of the, for those of you, I didn't miss anybody behind Tom, right? For those of you who don't know, um, once we do the presentation, we really want you to get interactive and involved and ask questions and share your ideas. So keep those minds churning during the presentation. And over to you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alyssa Kenny. I'm the executive director at DaneNet. I'm the one who stopped the fun networking. There's nothing like, let's all stop the fun and let Alyssa talk this time. Good morning. <laughs> um, but so I, I just wanted to start with a quick story. I, I've been in Madison for about 22 years. I was a student here. And um, when I graduated, I had the choice to go back to a really small rural community or to stay in the city. And I started working at community centers with youth programs, food pantries, things like that. But I worked in the Ally Dunmarsh neighborhood for about two years and then up in Vera Court for about eight years. And then I was the executive director at the Kennedy Heights Community Center. We did a variety of things there. But one of the things that really stuck out to me is every night as I was leaving, there was always, there was this sort of concrete, you know, accessible ramp around the edge of the center. And there was always, it was always filled to the edge with kids. And part of me always was like, oh, even though the community center's locked, kids still just want to be near the center. They love it. You know, all these kids had devices, of course, because we are really used to seeing kids with their faces and devices and adults. Um, and of course, I knew all these kids. They were coming to the program, so I started to talk to them. They, they were at the community center um, because they loved it, but they were also at the community center because it was their Wi-Fi. They were, you know, finishing up their homework. They were doing Facebook. But so the, the edge of the community center was basically lined with kids all the time because they were using our guest Wi-Fi access and they had to sit at the edge of the center after the door was locked to get online. And so the nice thing about technology is you can go look, right? Like you can see who's on my wireless network at night and how many, I, you know, so I, the next morning I got on and I wanted to see like, what's, what is our open network look like as far as usage, right? The IT guy in the room just gave me the eyes. He knows. <laughs> Crazy, right? There was like 50 people every night. So that meant, and you know, I sort of looked at what the, you know, the community center wasn't that close. So there was, you know, five or six apartments that, that connect. But basically at night, the neighborhood was coming and using the open guest network. 
And you know, this is Wisconsin. <laughs> it's, it's not like a super delight to stand outside in a neighborhood to use the Wi-Fi, but people clearly needed it and wanted it. And so that stuck with me a lot. I um, started working at DaneNet. We're a nonprofit here in Madison just about two years ago. I actually worked for them 15 years ago building community technology centers. Um, but so we were started way back in 1995. We were founded by some local nonprofits and volunteers and also UW Extension, who's an extension person here. Um, then we became a 501c3, and mostly we did IT for other nonprofits. So nonprofits felt like they didn't have the capacity themselves to do their own IT, so they formed a nonprofit to help themselves with nonprofit. So over the 20 years, we've done a bunch of stuff. You can see our logos kind of, we do technology in Dane County. So right now we work in three core areas. The first one is what we call technology education. And so those are coder dojos, maker clubs, so that would be a time where a kid might solder or learn some initial coding in Scratch or Python. Um, and those are custom technology education programs, and we only do them in places where kids wouldn't be able to afford a program. So we do them in community centers, boys and girls clubs, um, you know, in housing in housing developments, but we're, we're interested in reaching kids who wouldn't sort of have access to pay, you know, a $275 robot camp fee. Then we do IT for nonprofits, tech for nonprofits. We serve about 160 nonprofits in Dane County as their IT department. Um, we have 10 techs that work for us, helping anything from building out wireless networks to reconnecting their printer to, um, you know, actually wiring their building or converting them to voiceover. IP. And then our newest project has been going on for about nine months, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. That's called Everyone on Madison, and that's getting low-income households affordable internet and computers. And that sort of goes back to that initial story. That was something that really stuck out to me um, from my years of working with low-income families is, is how important that connectivity was um, and how so many families don't have it. So what is actually the scope? There's 14,000 households in Dane County without home internet access. Um, and if, if people, so all internet service providers have to register a report with the FCC, so it's really easy to see where that number goes. One in three adults, this is a national number, they report needing additional digital literacy skills. So they might have a computer, they might have home connectivity, but they feel like they can't quite use it, they don't know, they don't know what, what's real, they don't know what's an ad, they don't know what's spam. And this number, was astounding to me when I first heard it, and then I sort of started to keep track. But $3,000 is the amount of money and time a connected family saves every year. So if you have internet access, the price for your goods is cheaper, the time you save enrolling your kid in school is less, the amount of fees you pay, late fees, because you can go in at 11.58 and pay your bank bill, all those things are less. So you save $3,000 a year by having home internet access. It's, it's astounding, but if you really look at all the sort of consumer goods, tiny fees, and then the time. If you imagine having to take you know, a quarter day off from work or two hours off from work to take a bus to enroll your kid in school. I do that online at night at, while I'm watching well, I won't tell you what I watch. Lose <laughs> all respect for me, but you know, I, I can watch TV and, and roll my kid in school, right? Other families, they take a day off work, they get on a bus, they have to go somewhere to print out the special paper, whatever utility bill. They take another bus, they go to school. You know, that's lost time, tons of money. Um, so why is this so important uh, outside of money? Because money is important, and the, our economic viability is important. Technology is the great amplifier of human intentions. It's how we reach people. It's basically all our good intentions to do, you know, innovative startups, creative social good, all of that. All of that, if you have technology, it's like you have a big megaphone, right? And you can get your message out faster and further. And we have a whole set of our population and you know it's really consolidated in low-income families and families of color in Dane County, they don't have that amplification. And that means their ideas, their intentions, their want to volunteer, their want to contribute, all of that is muted because the rest of us have access. It also means that people have bad intentions and they use technology, <coughs> those are amplified. I should say, technology is as good as it is bad or is it as good as the human behind it. Um, so these are, 
a picture of some kids. They're outside doing their homework, outside of their school. They're doing it on a smartphone. So they have to download their assignments into Google Drive. You know, and then they actually are doing their work outside of their school. I don't know if you've ever ridden the city bus and seen kids working on the city bus, but there's lots of kids in Madison who do their homework on the city buses with Wi-Fi, right? City buses are hot spots. They need the Wi-Fi. If you ever go to a McDonald's and you see people parked in the parking lot, some of those people are people filling out a job application. Not to McDonald's, to anywhere, to the United States Postal Service, to Home Depot, Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree, the only place you can get a job at Dollar Tree, online. So if you don't have online access at home, that's, it hurts your homework completion, your health, your banking. I was here a few weeks ago, I heard the Jills. You know, it's gonna be the gig economy. Right now it's one in 20 people are making part of their income online. That's expected to double, triple, quadruple. Somebody from yesterday knows the right number. You wanna tell me, what's, where is it expected to go, the gig economy? Well, um, <clears throat> Tom still, I think, said Intuit predicted 40% of the American workforce by 2020 will be working in some form at a gig job or as a contractor. And so if there's 20% of the people who already are low income that can't access that at their house, that's a big deal. <clears throat> um, it affects everything. And a big thing, you know, people are here to network, right? Social networks happen in person, but a huge part of them and a huge part of that social capital, that will you pick up my kids from school, can you introduce me to this person, what event should I go to, a lot of that happens online. And so if people don't have access to that, they're, um, they're, they're just muted. They, they can't participate in digital society. And so digital equity is a social justice problem, but Madison is in this really unique place to solve this problem. We have tons of connectivity here. We have fiber all over the city, right? We have multiple providers. You go, you know, even to Marshall, Wisconsin, you go just a little bit north, rural, there are places in this state and there's inner cities all over this country that have no connectivity. Madison does not have that problem at all. People are often one yard away, 100 feet away from great connectivity. So there's connectivity all over. It's not a last mile, it's not a, quarter million dollar construction project. It's like a last yard problem in the city. Um, there's computers that people need. People need the digital literacy and then they need some ongoing support. And so we're lucky because we have a problem here but we have pretty much all the resources we need to solve it. It's one of the things that's interesting about this problem is it has to be a cross sector collaboration to solve it. Um, a nonprofit can't do it alone. Government can't do it alone. So like I said, we've got great connectivity here. Um, almost every address has broadband available, and most addresses here have what's called broadband choice, right? You get to make a choice between two or three providers. And finally, I don't know if people in the room are aware, but there's been lots of things that have happened at the FCC lately. So, right, AT&T and Time Warner merged, and when they did that, part of their merger was you have to offer low-income families subsidized connectivity. Same thing with Charter, Spectrum, Spectrum. <laughs> Internet Assist now, they have to offer low cost connectivity. Has anyone in this room heard about those programs? All right, so they're, so they're, they're starting to tell people. But, so there's connectivity available. <clears throat> in Dane County, 20,000 computers are recycled, refurbished, or resold every month. That's crazy. Right, I mean, think about how many people live here, half a million and 20,000 are recycled every month. There's about five computers for every adult, right? Sort of sounds crazy and then you start thinking, oh, well, I do have one at work and then I have that laptop and then I, you know. Um, most of those computers, 90% go out of state, right? They're sold at auction. And they go, you know, a, a, a big chunk of them are also fully recycled, but there's a lot of there's a lot of waste and a lot of actual value in those computers. And finally, there's already a whole bunch of classes and clinics available, a bunch that are offered in the library, Literacy Network, Madison College. Um, but there is some digital literacy available. DaneNet does some now. So here are the three people, that, the three sort of partners that we need to solve this digital equity problem. So DaneNet, where I work, and we do a lot of the leadership. We coordinate the volunteers. We teach the classes. 
we get the clients, so we have the connections to those, not to 14,000 people, but we, we find that disconnected households. Um, we gather the money and the computers. <coughs> we have local foundations that have become partners in this project, so we do need money for our work, um, and local foundations are also nonprofits. We have public partners. So the city of Madison, they're building their, their own fiber network and their own and lending that fiber network to this project to help connect families. And we also are really dependent on the Federal Communications Commission, right? Because they have these regulations that are bringing down the cost for low-income families for the first time. And finally, we have private partners. And our private partners are also really critical. So we have a refurbisher. We use Cascade Asset Management. They um, help store the computers. They reimage the computers. They warranty the computers, which is a big deal for families. We have the low-cost internet service providers that I mentioned. And then we have our computer donors. We have companies, local companies that are refreshing their computers and, and providing computers to the project. So CUNA Mutual, American Family, and Old National Bank. And so with these three partners sort of working collaboratively, we get <coughs> some solutions. So what we do is we take, we provide free computer classes, adults get some digital literacy skills, they enroll in a low cost internet program during the class, and at the end, adults can purchase a desktop computer for $50. And so this is, we've been doing this for nine months, and this is sort of where we're at. We've gotten 420 people connected. We've distributed 158 computers. We've had 183 adults come through a digital literacy class. And then we provide ongoing support clinics, and we've had 78 devices fixed or improved at clinics. Our goal is to reach 1,000 by the end of this year. So our request. Um, I'm hoping people will, will sort of understand digital equity as an important issue. Sometimes it gets forgotten. We think about housing and we think about food and we forget about asking about connectivity. Um, and it's critical. It, it's really, it, it connects to everything. And if we leave people, if we think about connectivity as an extra instead of an essential, those people, we're just going to keep building those wedges that we already know exist in our community. Please share our story if you know any disconnected um, families, if you know providers that might, or people who work with disconnected families. We're always looking for really committed tech savvy volunteers to help at our clinics and help with digital literacy. Like all nonprofits, we take money. Um, and then we, we, we search out big batches of enterprise computers. We don't take any residential or individual's computers because they, they're too much work for us. But we work with giant batches of computer donations. And so, again, I'm Alyssa. The website is Everyone on Madison if you want to just learn about this program. I'm from Dana. We're on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. We're not, we're like, we're on Twitter like for these few events a year. <laughs> don't, don't, go, don't go follow at Dana at Twitter. But we're, we're a little there. <laughs> Um, we're also we're a member of this National Digital Inclusion Alliance. If you're interested, kind of in this work nationally, or who else is working in this space, but we're the we're one of the two Wisconsin affiliates. There's two people doing affiliated nationally, and that's that's my presentation. So, if folks have questions, I'd love to or feedback or. When it comes to <clears throat> trying to get your message out there, it it seems like this is a natural cause related. Thing that tech companies, high tech, whether it's software, hardware, whatever, in Madison could become uh, affiliates with uh, or evangelists of. Um, are you pursuing that in any meaningful way? This is, you know, so the first six months we wanted to, to pilot, like make sure people would show up, make sure the computers worked, you know, make sure people were happy, you know. And so this is, this is sort of the beginning of that. How do we me going out and talking to Rotaries at a million cups is sort of the beginning of that partnership. Some of those big computer, the, the CUNA Mutual, Old National Bank, and American Family, they're partners. They're sort of committed to giving a percent of their refresh rate or what they, um, to the program in perpetuity, you know, into the future. And so. Well, well I'm, I'm yeah. just asking it from the point of view of, of marketing, the idea yeah. of walking into a a software company in Madison and saying, listen, I know you guys are associated with Komen for the Cure. Yeah. I know you're associated with other charitable nonprofit. What we'd like to do is bring you in as a tentpole partner or a 
some level of associate where you can do a hackathon in our name yeah. or you name it and the what we'd like to do is begin a conversation with you are you starting to market that way to or do you even have the staff to be able to do that kind of marketing we don't have them I mean we don't have the no, we're like every nonprofit that feel you know executive director accountant janitor type position titles um, but but that we we haven't done it yet but that's our hope is to start getting into those types of you know where people see us as a, a charity or a nonprofit that they would sponsor or support. Kind of to, piggy, to piggyback off that, um, I know in companies that I've worked for, they look for, they look for areas that they can do like corporate social justice work that align with their missions. So, and usually it's a struggle. There's so many nonprofits around here, but if you're a tech company, um, I think of like Five Nines, they do a ton of work in Madison providing free Wi-Fi and, and it's something they're passionate about um, that would be easy for them to get behind. Like Zendesk is kind of working on stuff similar to this and how do you get people connected and those would be great. Well, well and I think the financial backers as well. Yeah, yeah, well, and you begin the conversation then you find out what they can offer. If it's people's time, if it's money, if it's con connections, whatever. It could be as simple as creating a a sales oriented one sheet that takes the metrics that you have already mm -hmm. those are numbers mm -hmm. and especially if you're talking to tech people numbers speak more than words um, even if they are relatively small it's showing traction yeah. getting in you know so I'm offering my services to yeah. you as a, <laughs> as a creative marketer to create that marketing one sheet if you're interested in something like that yes. Let's trade cards. All right. Yes. Yeah, we have, you know, what we focused a lot on is marketing to people who are disconnected. So that... Right, the user, they, the end like user. The user, the end user, people who don't have... So we have a lot of materials, you know, so when we go out to a community center or sit at a food pantry, it, it's really clear people sort of understand the value. You know, I'm thinking of the, uh, the pyramid effect, the sped up effect, as you talk about your reach and getting out to all the way to the individual level with your nonprofits that you currently service mm -hmm. and what's you know what's your relationship with somebody like the United Way because of their relationship with so many other nonprofits yeah so both not United Way and community shares um, give us a little bit of money and different you know through some of their donors but what they often do for us is they use us as the we host some educational roundtables so when they're hosting events uh, for you know tech planning or technology strategy or what do what's happening they bring us in as the the content experts so we host a lot of technology roundtables for them and that's sort of a way for us to maybe meet new clients and also just give sort of a, a service or an educational workshop to our current clients but our our place at all those nonprofits is really critical to our success in this because our techs know where all the low-income people in the city are right because they're kind of working in those nonprofits and so it's this easy and we have a relationship with them they already know us and trust us so it's really easy for us to say now we're doing this thing and we want we want sort of direct access to your clients you know we want the community center that already trusts us as their IT support but that's been a, a big piece is, is accessing those those clients um, so I've worked with Cascade Asset Management um, as far as helping companies decommission their products and making sure they're wiped clean, but that's a pretty enterprise level service because of their cost. Mm -hmm. um, as far as introducing companies to your organization, do they offer you guys, like do they offer the companies an incentive to instead of resell, to donate, as far as cost saving your company? Because I know there's plenty of companies that say, we gotta wipe these, but it's gonna cost us you know, so we they try to recoup their costs by selling them, and that's probably why they're going out of state um, versus going into your hands. That yep. wasn't that was kind of a question and a statement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's sort of that business model disruption, right? That's sort of how people get rid of their technology. They resell it, and then in the reselling, they cover all their like cleaning, recycling, pickup fees. And so, um, what we've found. What we what we found effective so far is to go after um, or to work with companies that have really large refreshes, so we can only be asking for 10%. And for most of them, 10% almost feels like the margin of error because they never really know, um, you know, 
10 you know, so we just want 10% of your refresh. So if you're refreshing 1,000 computers, we just, can you give us 100 to this project? So we found that to be kind of an effective number. We, we haven't gone after companies that are refreshing 30 and asked for all of them because their business model is often they need to sell those computers to, um, cover, to cover the cost of recycling, cleaning, and pickup. But, but more companies have been saying yes to us. Uh, being we're meeting in a library, I want to reference a book that is yeah. about it's, it's Thomas Friedman, who's a very popular author. We all and the world is flat. Remember that book about the. But your point about connectivity, and he's got a new book out about it. Just um, thank you for being late. I'm reading right now, but it delves into the technology and the globalization aspect worldwide. He's fascinating, you know, perspective. But it, it, it does allude to the fact that what you talked about people. Uh, how many people are not connected on, on through our what we take for granted, and then those that are using the free Wi-Fi's and you know resourcefulness to try to tap into what's going on um, globally, especially seeing what's that. just an interesting read, and you know his life in Minnesota growing up versus what he deals with now, you know just working in the world. So FYI, it's just this is just a statement about you know what's. Can you say the title again? Uh, thank you for being late. That might probably Friedman, who you probably all know, he's a New York Times journalist. But it's any anyway, FYI, it's just something that hit, when you were talking, it made me realize a book I'm reading right now that wow, very relevant, you know, relationship. That's, that's all. I, I want to commend you for you know doing this. It's so important. And what's different for me is that it's not just good. It is a social justice issue. And I'm asking this question because I think if anybody's going to know the answer, you probably you pr may know um, that the connectivity issue is a huge issue in the rural areas. And I understand that there's some kind of movement afoot, and I know Mark Pocan um, supports it, kind of like the Rural Electrification Act of the 1930s, you know to get connectivity out. Can you speak to that? Do you know about that and what, what the current status is? Sure. It's, well, Connecting America Fund dollars likely are sort of the federal money and then the state office of broadband service support. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> There's an S, but so they then grant out mostly to telecommunications agencies that then build out to, you know, it's, I mean, sometimes though the, the costs are astronomical. They've done, you know, Sometimes five families get connected for a hundred thousand dollars. You know, it's in rural communities. It's really it's a it's a different issue. Um, yes. It's why it's why the problem sort of so easy. And I don't want to say so easy here, but there are places in the country where people have one meg up. You know, like one meg service. You just you can't run a business. Like you can't you you can't even sort of farm. I mean, people are sort of saying like farmers need connectivity. Correct. Yeah, so. in, in this case, like when I lived, I just moved from the country back into the city. Yeah. <clears throat> when I say city, I mean Wanakee, it's a little town. <laughs> <laughs> but my speed at home, and I worked from the house, my speed over copper back, you know, then was eight megs up, or eight megs down by one half up. So I couldn't even connect to my VPN, because I would dump. And I couldn't use my phone, because I have a, a, a internet-based phone, a white phone. So I couldn't <laughs> use my phone at home. And so, <clears throat> Well, my, all of my relatives are farmers. And so to get files over to their accountant through QuickBooks and things like that, they have to physically run them in on a USB drive or on a flash drive or whatever. So a lot of those things like you're talking about are, in Dane County specifically, they're talking about upgrading the fiber network. So TDS is, owns most of the, of the copper in the area, and they run on the, on the overhead poles if you drive through the country. And so my little neighborhood now is one of them that didn't get fiber optics through the build out that TDS did. So what they did and what they're mimicking now and taking some of these dollars for are to upgrade the fiber network. So they're, whatever, they're optimizing the copper in some of these rural areas and it's less expensive than doing full build outs. Um, but, and I don't work on the residential side, I only work on the commercial side. We have a group that's rural based and they're sharing internet with the farmhouse next door, they kind of share a driveway. You have 30 engineers in the office with 10 meg down and maybe one and a half up. They can't even, they can't do any web conference, they can't do anything. And so we went out through one of our partners 
and found a group, an ISP group, that will actually donate the fiber run to get them connected. It's a four and a half mile fiber run from the nearest junction box. But we talked to them and <clears throat> they only asked that the client sign a longer term agreement and then they'll cover, it was a $85,000 build out. And so there's a lot of the ISPs that are looking to help with this as well. But it's, you have to, it's just a channel thing. I, you know, with rural communities, they're, they're going to have to answer this big question of, do we build fiber, which I think there's a great case for, right? We all have electricity to our home, not generators. Or do we wait for 5G? Because 5G is going to be sort of one of those technology changes, and it's, it's coming, and rural communities don't have as many buildings, you know. So um, the towers are cheaper. The towers are cheaper. There's less, particularly Wisconsin's relatively flat, and so, um, the Office of Broadband Support or Service will keep on doing, will keep on building out in rural communities, but it's, it's really incremental. Like, you know, they give out $5 million, which sort of sounds like a lot, but often that's connecting, um, you know, another 200 households or, or maybe like, or maybe one dense neighborhood of 2,000 plus. Um, and then what, what, what I see as problematic is at the state of Wisconsin, there's, there's no regulation on the pricing, right? So the state pays for the capital cost and the provider can charge whatever they want. Um, in other states, if the state pays for some of the capital costs in Minnesota, then they, they have some price control over the, the, for at least five years after, so the provider can't just say, yeah, now you've got 1G service, by the way, it's you know, $100 a month. I saw one more hand back there. Uh, well, it was just a 5G follow-up. I mean, but you're also seeing that instead of the, the huge towers and, and all the, the, the smaller scale using telephone poles and, and you know other th making it lower level connectivity on the 5G realm that um, it's just a different approach technologically than used to in the past. I'm site to site is going to play into that too as well. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not trying to morph into super techo you know language, but it just it's a different approach yeah. than we used. I, I mean, I know. I think it will, I think 5G will change that, you know, there's sort of the smart g cities movement, that cities will be a lot more connected when they have 5G, or a lot more devices, streets, we're hearing our pizza boxes, right, will be connected, <laughs> so. What's your number one need <clears throat> on the user side, attraction, or on the message side, amplification? Um, amplification. So I think it's really interesting, the Pew Research Foundation, who sort of is the research body for this type of work, so in 2015, 30% of the people who weren't online weren't online because they didn't think it was relevant. They found it not to be relevant to their life. 2017's data, or maybe, no, 2014, 2016, 4% of people who weren't online were saying relevancy. So. It used to be you sort of had to convince people that being connected was relevant to their life, and that's not the case anymore. For almost everybody we're meeting, it's about digital literacy and it's about affordability. And so when we say to them, there's this affordable option, and there's this way for you to get to low-cost computer, for the most part we've seen, um, we've seen a lot of, you know, our classes have been heavily attended. Um. So going back to actually your original question about outreach to tech companies, yeah. if you are, when you're, when you're ready, if you would like either starting block to include you in um, our newsletter that goes out to um, our innovation entrepreneurs, please let me know how we can be helpful about that. Mm -hmm. And then also from a larger mission with starting block, our, one of our strategic goals is to help launch great companies. And when I say my great company, that means companies that are um, financially successful but also good to their employees and good to our community mm -hmm. and so we're looking at ways in which we can partner with nonprofits in a complementary way with the IT sector startups that we serve to support so I'd love to continue to talk to you about how we can support <coughs> doing that. Thank you. I know people want the fun to start again right? <laughs> <laughs> Should be done so people can go back to networking and there's a baby in the room so that, that ends <laughs> There's a smile. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I really appreciate this opportunity yeah. to talk. And